Good morning. I'm Jim, and together with Elisa and Mary, we'd like to welcome you to this celebration of the generation born between 1929 and 1945. Growing up during the Great Depression and War, they came of age at a time when America was becoming a global superpower. They grew up at a time when older people were fighting wars and making great sacrifices on their behalf. They moved cautiously in a social order no one wanted to disturb. They rarely talked about changing the system, rather working within it. On this All Saints Sunday, we invite you to celebrate with us a portion of the saints among us here at Ascension. We hope you enjoy this video. Economically, militarily, politically, the country was ready for a generation to take the reins and help create a new world order. There was a new booming economy ready to join right out of school. Some call them the lucky or fortunate generation. Time magazine in 1951 labeled them the silent generation because they worked hard, played by the rules, valued financial security, and espoused traditional values. They are builders and traditionalists. They are the healthiest, most educated, and wealthiest generation of elders ever to have lived. Some people in their 40s, 50s, and 60s try to keep their age a secret but I say, when you get as old as I am, you start bragging about it. I'm Charles Lewis. I was born in Minot, North Dakota in 1929, in July. That was about uh, three months before the stock market crash. I joined the Navy and then went to the Naval Academy, and when I graduated, there was no Air Force Academy, so a quarter of the class was commissioned the Air Force. So I went to Air Force pilot training and spent over 20 years in the Air Force. Uh, I had a tour in Vietnam, went to Air Force School at George Air Force Base and then went to Vietnam. And of course the most important event was when the bomb blew our airplane apart and I had to eject and parachute into North Vietnam and got rescued by a helicopter. We were trained on what we're supposed to do if something bad happens. and. I just did what we were supposed to do. My generation uh, was sort of in between these known generations, you know. There, I mean, there was the, um, the greatest generation, and then there is the, um, the boomers. But I'd never heard of the silent generation. I am Karen Rubinell and I was born in Bismarck, North Dakota in April of 1943. I think our gener my generation's legacy is uh, because of the fact that we were right behind and we were the recipients of the greatest generation who had a great um, movement to get a good education to come back from war, to get to work, to do things that were productive. And this was promoted, and I think my generation benefited from that. The 1950s saw the construction of the interstate highway system and turnpikes tying America together. Mass-produced housing developments, known as Levitt Towns, sprang up in the suburbs and factories previously building military material began producing consumer goods at an unprecedented level. Technologically, they were witness to the birth of computers. Their worldview, however, was shocked with the launch of Sputnik and the fear of falling behind the Soviet Union. However, that only spurred this generation to go all in, develop a space program, and ultimately place a man on the moon. When I got out of the service, um, I started working for Honeywell, and they were uh, they were in the semiconductor type business. So right away we got involved in building electronics that uh, that went on space missions. My name is Floyd Bueller. I was born in a little town or outside of a little town called Orinoco, in the southeastern part of Minnesota. What year were you born? 1937. I had the opportunity. Uh, when I was in Florida uh, to see the first uh, station, the, what, they, what they call the launching uh, area in there. And it had, 
the, the Honeywell Brown recorder in there that recorded a few stuff, had a few little pieces of electronics, and that was it. That was the communications to the, to the satellites, to the launches and the, and the satellites. Now if you go to those places, they're just, just you know, layers and layers of sophistication. Even for us that started in on that thing, to go down there and see how primitive the communications were for the people in that space shuttle, it was amazing. I think each generation is a foundation for the one that comes next. My name is Kate Kirkendall. I was born September 30th, 1945 in Long Beach, California. Even though the greatest generation had so many things going on with them, and, and I think they're the ones that kind of started the whole silent thing, I think it's kind of a, an, inter, an inner looking, reflecting, deciding who you want to be and how you want to get there. And I think that foundation carries on to the next who says, okay, now we've got this, this is how we go. Everybody's going to do it differently. We grow and we change, but we have that foundation. And that's what I feel like that we've given. On the international level, they saw the birth of the atomic age and lived through years of above ground nuclear weapons testing. They were witness to the beginning of the Cold War, the creation of the Iron Curtain, the Berlin airlift, the threat of communist infiltration in America, and the McCarthy era in reaction to it. They experienced the first limited war of the century in Korea, but were blessed with a decade mostly free of war and a stable presidency. An offshoot of the economic prosperity was the rise of the youth culture. Since many adolescents could stay in school through high school and weren't as often required to work outside the home, new forms of music, movie, entertainment, and fashion targeting youth arose. So I like uh, Kukla, Fran, and Ollie. I don't know if anyone remembers that. You do, yeah. <laughs> My age. <laughs> I'm Catherine Mayer, or Kathy Mayer, and I was born in December of 1945. As a teenager, I liked to talk on the phone for hours with my girlfriends about everything that happened that day. That includes what so-and-so was wearing and what they said and who was going to break up and who was going to get with somebody else. I believe it was Alan Freed. I might have said his name wrong. Alan Freed, and we used to listen to that with them listening to it and me on the other end, and then we would discuss the song and what was coming on. This was an important evening spent with the girls on the phone. I was kind of a shy kid, or at least I used to think it was shy. I, well, I was shy. I'm Steve Passan. Uh, I was born in August of 1943 in um, Los Angeles, Southern California. To the best of my recollection, Los Angeles and Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania were probably two of the centers where television started really growing. Uh, out in uh, California, there was uh, Time for Beanie, there was Doy O'Dell, there was uh, The Lone Ranger, uh, which had converted, had made the, the, the switch from radio to um, television. I remember listening to Clayton Moore and Jay Silverheels on the radio uh, with The Lone Ranger, and they made a successful switch to television. Wartime inventions born of necessity and inventions following the war changed America and the world forever. These inventions made life easier, healthier, and more enjoyable for the silent generation. They enable them to build upon the success of previous generations and create a new, better, and safer world for the upcoming baby boomers. Color television <laughs> and the microwave oven. I can't tell you how many hot dogs I made <laughs> wrapping the bun and the, the, the weenie in, in, wet, in a, a paper towel and stick it in the microwave and yes, isn't that awesome? My, my son still talks about that and, and when he tells his kids, go make a hot dog like grandma makes them. <laughs> when there was an invention, we usually didn't get one of them for many years. 
Why is that? We couldn't afford it. <laughs> I don't know if, I can't remember exactly when it happened, but I think like the Salk vaccine was something that made a big impression. The transition from horses to tractors, that was pretty big. Work became a lot easier on the farms when, when we were working, when, when the, we could set on a tractor instead of trying to make horses do what we wanted them to do. Television. I remember our first television. It was a Philco. had a round screen. It had a wooden cabinet, wooden knobs, just like the radios used to have at the time. Back then, they were, the inventions were much slower, you know, they were, but they were much more impactful. Now, you know, they've done so many of the, of the inventions that make life easy for us. Now we're going for the ones that entertain us. On this All Saints Sunday, we remember those living and no longer with us who have impacted our lives. Members of the silent generation take a moment to reflect on their faith journey. I have to thank Joel Zelmer. We were on a Rhodes Scholar trip with Joel and, and Jan and got to know them. We just randomly happened and, oh, you're in Colorado Springs? Oh goodness, we lived like three miles from each other. They came to our Christmas open house. We spent some time. And when he passed away, Eric saw the announcement in the newspaper and his funeral was here. That's when we came. And it was like open arms welcomed us. We didn't know anybody. People didn't know us. I clearly believe there is a God that created the everything. Um, but I'm struggling with a lot of my other beliefs. I was in a Lutheran church till I was maybe five or six years old. Uh, and uh, I was no longer in a Lutheran church and visited various churches throughout my growing up. And at some point, no churches. And uh, it was kind of like coming home. The main thing is that uh, all of this I cannot imagine that any of this, whatever there is, existed without some creator creating it. My mother was raised Lutheran. Um, she comes from a German family and they had these German Lutheran churches in her community and she was very, very active. Her family is very active in the Lutheran church. And my father really was not raised in the church, but I was baptized when I was a baby, and um, then when we moved to Riverdale, then I became very active in, in church, Sunday school and church, and then Luther League, as I called it at that time. And um, I couldn't understand why my dad didn't go to church. So when I was little, I asked him, I said, Daddy, how come you don't go to church with us? And he didn't say much. I don't remember even what he said. But then before long, he had never been baptized. And before long, he had been, he was baptized and he went, you know, he became a member of the church. And my mom always said it was because I'd asked him. I think everything I learned about God, I assumed to be a truth. You know? But I think the, my biggest takeaway from it is, is I think the promise of eternity. And you know, if you have, if you have that, you can get through a lot in life.